I'm very honored. Thank you. Um, I don't want to go too long because I don't want to take any time from the illustrious Aaron Murphy, who I'm very excited to hear from. Um, but uh, I just found out that I'm doing this breakout session. And uh, the topic is zeal for the Temple Mount. Really, it all, when you're talking about the Temple Mount, everything converges. Everything comes together. And um, I thought I would start by sharing a, uh, what happened to me when I was arrested on the Temple Mount. It was a, a very profound experience in my life, something that when I look back at and I uh, re-experience it, I, it's almost like a blackout. I don't know if you have any experiences like that in your life where when you remember it, you almost don't, it's not there. It's like a, the page was taken out and I have nothing to refer to. And the only way I can understand that is that the experience was so transcendent that I was just connected to a different place altogether. What happened was, uh, there's a, a village called Halamish in Samaria, and there's an Arab terrorist that decided that he wanted to go and murder Jews. Unfortunately, this is not unheard of. And according to his own testimony, what did he do? He was going around the exterior fence, listening to which house had the most laughter coming from it. That's how he decided who he was going to attack. Who had the most laughter and joy? And of course, there was, it was the Solomon family because they were celebrating the bris, the circumcision of their son. So there was laughter and celebration, and he went in and brutally murdered nearly the entire family. And it was devastating, devastating. And unfortunately, we as a nation have such post-traumatic stress disorder from this whole thing that after recoiling from it, and of course the fallout from the rest of the world where the family is blamed, for the occupation or whatever insanity it is. But uh, while this was happening, this was at the same time, if you remember, as the whole metal detector scandal on the Temple Mount. As ridiculous as that was, the things that are happening on the Temple Mount to me are the most extreme examples of injustice. And to, hear, to be able to see the world equivocate and ignore blatant, overwhelming double standards. You want to go to a shopping mall in Jerusalem. You want to go to a restaurant. You have to go through a metal detector. But no, they can't go through metal detectors going onto the Temple Mount right after they murdered policemen right up there. And of course, Israel yielded. No metal detectors. But while all of this was happening, they weren't going up, and I, was, I felt this, this internal stirring. And what was the stirring? You know, the prophets say that when the Jewish people return to the land of Israel, mol et levavenu, there will be a circumcision of the heart. And the only way I can understand that on a personal experiential level is that I get this overwhelming intuitions that I don't know where they come from, but I just feel strongly about it, and rather than writing it off as something I don't understand, I'm now listening very intently, as, as hard as I can, please, Hashem, speak louder, let me know what I should do. And I felt this intuition that I need to go up on the Temple Mount and say the Kaddish, the prayer over the dead. This family was so holy, and where else other than the, and what is the prayer for, for the dead? It doesn't have anything to do with death. It says, May God's name be elevated and magnified in the world. We're praying for peace. We're praying for God's name to be magnified. It's not about death, it's about life. And in the merit of this family, their, their lives were given as for being Jews. Let their, their lives not go for nothing, but let life and God's name be magnified and sanctified in the world. So I went up onto the Temple Mount, and of course, if you're a Jew, you know the story, right? I can skip it. You know the story. If they see you're a Jew, if you're a Christian, you go up, you just enjoy, keep going. If you're a Jew, they will pull you off to the side, give you the fifth degree, search you, and say, we're going to have the Islamic walk follow you around, and if we see your mouths moving, you will be arrested. So you go up, and as you're walking, of course, there's like Arabs walking alongside the walk, screaming, often, Idbach al Yud, death to Jews. Right? Uh, Allah Akbar, Allah is the ultimate. Allah is the greatest. Screaming, and we're not even allowed, they're looking at our mouth. 
Are, are, are you whispering? Are you whispering? And let me just tell you, there's wisdom to what they're doing. There's wisdom there because they understand something that a lot of us don't, that there's no greater damage to their cause than Jews and all those who were praying to the God of Israel to pour out our hearts in that place. They know what they're doing. They're not old, antiquated, silly, and tribalistic. They understand that this is a spiritual war at its core. So I went up, and when we're at that very place where there's still a commandment to this day to prostrate ourselves, I stood up and I, I said to, there, there, so there's 50, maybe 40 Jews, 40 to 50 Jews that we're walking there with, and of course they're following us, and we can only be up for 15 minutes. We can't stop for, it's so high pressure, high anxiety. Whereas Christians are just filing up, stay there for hours. And of course, anywhere in the land of Israel, an Arab can go and pray wherever they want to. But somehow they're under the occupation and not us. But that's neither here nor there. And so I went to that place and I turned around and I said, the, the, the Solomon family, let us say Kaddish. So I said, Yitkadal v'yitkadash Shemei Now this is a prayer that Jews in their synagogues all the time this is, this is the, the most prevalent, prominent prayer that breaks up in our liturgy all of the different prayers. So every Jew reflexively and automatically, it's like an instinct, says, Amen. And what happened was the police came in, they swarmed me, and they jumped on me, they put their hands over my mouth. Now, a friend of mine pointed out to me an interesting thing. If you see a protester arrested anywhere else in the world, what do they do? They restrain their arms, they restrain their legs, but they're screaming whatever they're screaming. Here they didn't touch my hands and my legs. First thing they did, put their dank, sweaty hands over my mouth to prevent me from praising God and, and praying for global peace and brotherhood. As the Arabs are around screaming, death to Jews. So as I'm being taken away, I heard in the walkie-talkie, uh, the guy who was taking me away, who was, by the way, a very nice guy, and said, I really can understand where you were coming from. Some, one of the other policemen said to him, you know, they all, all the Jews there said, Amen. We have to arrest all of them. So there's going to be 40 arrests <laughs> because they said, Amen. So the policeman with me said, forget about it. We're not doing that right now. So they arrested five people. Randomly took five people and arrested them. And so that was um, a difficult experience. But at the same time, that very moment when I said, Yitka Dalv, Yitka, this is actually my first time really sharing this story. I, I don't know why. I just haven't really shared it like that. But when I said those words, I don't remember anything at that point. I've seen the video, but I remember my vision through my eyes. I saw nothing. And it felt like something beyond and transcendent was happening. But um, it's very wise that they are doing everything they can to prevent us from praying because they understand something that the Western world doesn't and that so many people don't, and that's that this is not a political conflict that we're having with them. Right? They say it's about Judea and Samaria. It's about the West Bank. When was the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, when was it liberated? In 1967. When was the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the PLO, founded? In 1964. Were they founded in 1964 to liberate the settlements of 1967 that didn't even exist yet? What did they want to liberate? The entire land of Israel. There cannot be one millimeter that is under Jewish control. Why? Because Islam divides the world up into Dar al-Harb and Dar al-Islam, the world of the sword and the world that is under Muslim rule. And their goal of jihad is to expand the world that it's all under Sharia law and under Muslim rule. And as that's happening, the, ISIS is expanding. And as the Muslim world is growing and growing and growing, there's this tiny little speck in the heart of God's soul that everybody recognizes as this is where it's all happening. It's under Jewish rule. That cannot be tolerated in the mind of a Muslim at all. It doesn't matter if it's one city block, because what that means is Allah is not the ultimate God, and Islam is not the ultimate religion. And so this is a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual war, and the epicenter of this war is the Temple Mount. That's where it's all happening. 
See, it's important that I, that I share this with you because there's this issue we have in the West of projecting. We project our values on the rest of the world. So we look at, um, at let's say I'm in the army, in the last war in Gaza, you see Hamas, they're hiding uh, in kindergartens, firing missiles. So as, as a normal person, we say, what a bunch of cowards hiding behind children. But then they look at us, hiding our children behind us. And they say, what a bunch of cowards that aren't willing to sacrifice everything. Right? It's so different. There's such a foundationally different way of seeing the world. So it's important for us, I think, to recognize that there's no intrinsic power in them. Looking at the Arabs and, and having hatred in our hearts for them, first of all, we already lose. We already lose the battle. Hatred is corrosive, and it's it, believing that there really is this duality in the world. Whereas if we really recognize, think about a man beating a dog with a stick. What does the dog do? It bites at the stick. The Arabs are the stick in God's hands. But God is wielding this stick. So if we turn our hearts to God and say, what is your message to us? Well, maybe it's worth looking in the stick and understanding what is that stick attacking? There's obviously something built in to this attack on the Jewish people at our very core. What are they attacking? Our right to this land, the land of Israel. What is our, our right? Think about Ahmadinejad. And the, the, the Iranian, remember when he founded, funded that International Holocaust Denial Conference? Think about that. So this is 60 years before, and he's putting millions of dollars into a conference denying the Holocaust. Who cares? It was 60 years. So it did happen. It didn't happen. Why would he do that? Well, think about an Israeli politician or diplomat. The first place they bring a foreign politician, a foreign leader that comes to Israel, where is it? Yad Vashem. Yad Vashem. And the message there is, this is why we have a right to be in this land. Look what happens to us when we don't have a land. This is what happens. This is our right to the land. Look at the Holocaust. So he says, oh, really? Your right is the Holocaust? Well, the Palestinians didn't do the Holocaust. Why should it be at their expense? And if that's your right, then the Holocaust didn't even happen. Now what's your right? So if we say the United Nations Resolution 242, okay, we're going to put the right our, our principled right of being here, we're going to say it's because of a United Nations resolution. Well, we all know what would happen if the United Nations voted again. What is the reason all of this is happening? Because we need to stand up before the entire world and sanctify God's name and say our right to this land is because God gave it to us. That is our right to this land. And that's what they will respect. You know, I'm living on a hilltop. Uh, uh, it's the most unbelievably, breathtakingly epic thing I've ever experienced in my life by an exponent. For four years we've been building it up. I've been living there for two years at the southeastern tip of Jerusalem. There's something unbelievably transcendent about this place. But in order to get there, you drive, it's actually from here, about a half hour. But it is on the southeastern tip of Judea, meaning there's no Jews further out than us. Aaron, I want you to stop me when I hit my time, okay? There's no Jews further out than us. So when, when I started living there, we had to decide with our very finite resources, are we going to plant trees or are we going to build walls and fences and security systems? And we all decided, me and my partner Jeremy and my two other partners, we said, no more. We're not in a ghetto anymore. We're not living in fear. We're not doing the walls. We're planting trees. And so I was the first one to live on this home on a hill. I didn't even have bars on my windows. There were people that were afraid to leave the settlement that you have to go through to get there because it means leaving the fence and then what is protecting you? And I spent two years living out there. I've been, I'm still there right now. And I didn't have a moment of fear. And I haven't had really any issues. And why is that? I think the idea is that the Arabs see and they see, well, if that guy's not afraid of us, maybe there's a reason we should be afraid of him. And there's something to that. There's something to that. There's, I'm, I'm really getting to more deeply understand them. And I'm understanding the entire situation in a whole different way. Um, out of all of them, I would say my best friend, his name is Arif. 
He's a big guy. That he, they're hard workers, by the way. Hard workers and excellent workers. This guy's about my age, just strong as an ox. I teach him English. He teaches me Arabic. We eat together. But I would say if one of them were to go jihad and try to kill me, it would be him. But I still genuinely like him. As strange as that sounds, and I think that he likes me too, even though he still wants to kill me. Because there is a understanding that we're both here and we're both willing to sacrifice our lives for this place. And that's the root. The root of what this whole conflict, I believe, is about is the, willing, the willingness to sacrifice. Because we're looking at this Arab-Israeli conflict, and you hear about it on the news all the time. There's no solution. It's never going to be solved. It's only going to be transcended. Only when we realize we're looking at the whole thing totally wrong. And so, let me just see here. So what's the root? What's the root of this place? And I'm going to wind it down, Aaron Murphy, so you can speak, because this guy is fantastic. You picked the right breakout session to come to. Um, Abraham, Abraham sends away Hagar and Ishmael to be sent into the desert to die by your father. That is some serious post-traumatic stress. That is an intergenerational rejection that is of the most profound visceral nature that you can imagine that the descendants, the entire nation, is carrying that around with them. And then when he comes back, our sages tell us that he went to, Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac, and he said, Vayarata makom merachok, he saw the place from a distance. He said, Ishmael, what do you see? I see a mountain. What do you see, Eliezer? I see a mountain. And what did Isaac see? He saw a pillar of smoke emerging between heaven and earth. And he said, okay. Isaac, come with me. And he went to sacrifice Isaac, and he said to Ishmael, you stay here with the donkey. That is a very serious foundational rejection. And that, to me, is really, you know, do you know the story, I don't know if someone's told it yet, about Rabbi Akiva on the Temple Mount? The other sages that are with him, they see it in destitution, and it's, it's destroyed. And there are foxes running around on the Temple Mount. And and they're all weeping, and Rabbi Akiva is laughing. They say, how can you possibly be happy and laugh at a moment like this? And he said, just as the prophecy that the temple would be destroyed, and there would be foxes running on the temple mountains come true, so too the prophecy about the rebuilding of the third temple. So he was celebrating in its prophetic construction that it will exist. But if you take the Hebrew letters for Shu'alim, which are foxes, the same letters, if you mix them around, Zach, you ready for this? Yishmael. Yishmael and Shualim, foxes and Ishmael have the same exact letters. And so right now, we are going up on the Temple Mount, and we see what can only be described, honestly, as jackals screaming and heckling because the earth is shaking under them. They feel what's happening. They feel the winds shifting. Our sages say that Ishmael had a real sacrifice, real merit. He had real merit. When was he sacrificed? At what, when was he circumcised? At what age? 13. 13. So our sages say that Ishmael, for every year that he was alive before the sacrifice, got 100 years of dominance over the Temple Mount. That's 1,300 years. When did Islam take control? 700. They feel their apportioned time ending. And there's nothing they can do about it. You know, when I was in the army and I had uh, commanders, one of them would scream his brains out. We weren't afraid of him. It was the guy that whispered. That's the guy we were afraid of. And so when I see them screaming their brains out, I see a foundational insecurity. They feel the winds shifting. They know they're losing their grip on it. And we just have to have the slightest of a whisper on our lips. And God is bringing the temple to us now. You know, I'll tell you about my place, and I'm going to end it with this. I want to, first of all, invite all of you to come out and see what we're doing on the southeastern tip of Judea. For four years, we've been there. I haven't been able to name it. For, for people to say, what's the name? I just don't know yet. I can't know. It's not something you could just name. A name encapsulates the essence of something. And this place that we're at is so transcendent that I simply can't describe the name. And if I had more time, 
I would share with you from Abraham. So Abraham awoke early. I guess I'm doing it. Woke up early in the morning and saddled his donkey. He took his men. He split the wood of the offering to the place of which God spoke to him. On the third day, Abraham perceived the place from afar. Isaac, for Jacob, he gets to the temple man. He says, Ma no raha makom hazah. How awe-inspiring is this place? All of our, our, our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we could go through all the sources, called the Temple Mount the place. The place. Now, when, uh, when the Jewish laws of mourning, if a Jew dies, they, their family sits Shiva. The wisdom of this ritual of sitting Shiva is tremendous. But when you go to visit the family, you, you say a, a certain sentence to them. And you say that sentence, you say, Hamakom. May the place comfort you among the mourners of, of Zion and Jerusalem. Why? This is the, one of the only places where we actually call God, His name, God's name is the place. Why do we say that to a mourning family? Because there's a subconscious con consolation that while their loved one is no longer physically in this world, within the place of God's total, complete existence, their soul and our soul are still together. We're still next to each other. It looks different, but within the place of God, we're all in existence together. And so there's, there's definitely a deep intrinsic connection between the name of the Temple Mount being the place, God's name being the place, that it is from that foundation stone that all of creation came into existence that God has filled the earth as water fills the sea. And so that really is what the Messiah is going to bring. You know, when I think about it to its essence, when Mashiach comes, I used to have, we pray for redemption, redemption. What is redemption? Since moving out to this hilltop in Judea, I can tell you, I don't know. I don't know what it's going to look like. It's mysterious beyond my understanding. But what I, what I can say is that I think that the whole world is gonna have one big cry. We're all just going to weep together in realizing the tragedy of what all of history has been since Adam eating from the tree and us blaming each other and us hating each other when we're all of God's children and all we want is peace. So may that day please come soon for us. May the temple be rebuilt. Amen. Amen.